Have you heard of the EAC movement? These hyper tech optimists. I think we need, especially in the church, we almost need an amount of that because there was so much fear mongering among Christians. If that's our only stance, then we're not building the technology of the future. Okay, then who's building these technologies? Non Christians yeah. because Christians are scared of it. When I think of some of the key fears that come from maybe the more religious quarters in terms of AI, it's all about dehumanization, isn't it? I had a conversation with someone the other day and I said, if you thought about where dehumanization could actually be pretty redemptive, like in a part of the world where humans are at risk for spreading the gospel of Jesus, what about if AI could do that job? It's too easy to jump on the memes that come on people's feeds and whatnot, which are probably AI generated as well, um, <laughs> <laughs> that, that start planting all this fear, right? We are super excited to welcome on the podcast, Kevin Burgess. Kevin is a UK native who's now living in Canada, of all places. I think right. we're going to have to have him answer for that one. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> in any case, uh, we invited Kevin on the podcast because he's the director of global communities for an organization called Faith Tech. And we've actually had another affiliate of Faith Tech on the podcast. Adam Graber was on in August to talk mm -hmm. about an article on uh, AI he had written for Christianity Today. Mm -hmm. And um, I personally actually attended a small lab that Faith Tech hosted for the Web3 space earlier mm -hmm. last year. Uh, and I also met some interesting figures, uh, including Evan, who we also had on the podcast to talk Evan about Evan Thacker, AI. great guy. Yeah, yeah great guy. Yeah, Evan Thacker. Mm. So, so we've had like... some interesting conversations with yeah. a number of people who are affiliated with and associated with Faith Tech. Mm. So we thought it'd be great to get you on, Kevin, to kind of give us a little insight about what Faith Tech's actual mission is mm. and uh, what, how it might be similar to things we discuss on the podcast, specifically how you guys reach out to builders in the tech space. And specifically, if we can talk about the emerging tech space, I think that would be super cool. Yeah. So why don't you just give us a little bit of a background on what Faith Tech is? What's the vision? You know, what, uh, what are you guys doing in the space and where do you see all this going? Mm, absolutely. And uh, yeah, really pleased to hear you were part of the, the Web3 Lab there. That was a bit of an experiment we ran last year in terms of let's let's create a bit of a playground and see what we can do ministry wise with some of this technology. And yeah, with the likes of Evan in the mix, it was really good fun to see some of the stuff that came out of there. But in terms of faith tech, we um, we call ourselves a global tech community for Christ. So um, we uh, we our our sort of core mission is to gather Christians from across the tech ecosystem, offer them an opportunity for community. And I think we'll talk a bit later about why we need to do that, um, but um, offer them the opportunity for to, to gather together, but then also offer them the opportunity to leverage their time and their talents and build together for the for the sake of Jesus. And um, those are the two key offerings that we have, our communities and lab projects. And um, we've, we've done a lot of work developing the whole lab program in the last few years and building a playbook about how we do that. So um, in terms of if you asked us our purpose statement right now, that's actually moved a little bit in just the last few months. We've been thinking about why we do community and why we do projects and saying, what has God called us to that's uniquely involving us in this space of community and projects together. And um, and uh, we actually, we did an online meetup last night where James sort of aired this publicly for the first time. So it's still a little bit hot off the press, but um, we, we see our core purpose statement right now is to awaken a Jesus revival in and through technology. Um, and the in and through pieces in technology, we believe that as we bring Christians from across the tech ecosystem, builders, thinkers, theologians, ministers, missional people, um, and get them to think deeply about how we relate to technology and how we build with technology, that they can actually take that back into the tech ecosystem. And our heart is to see a core revival happening there. We believe God's already on the move there, which is why we use the word awaken a revival, because we don't get to start a revival. God gets to do that and we get to see what he's doing and get excited about it and, and become a part of that through what he's already doing. So that's, that's what we seek to do. And then through technology is because as we build things, we want to see products built, literal products pulled together that help 
bring people into the kingdom of God and help introduce people to the person of Jesus. And, and that's the, the core driver of, of, of why we do what we do. And, um, you know, we could do a bunch of really cool meetups and, you know, everyone gets to network and change business cards and, and pitch their ideas to each other. But we feel like we, we're called to a deeper sense of community, one which is sacrificial in nature um, and that's why we encourage people to come and build and sacrifice of their time and their talents to do something that, you know, otherwise they could be building something else that earns them money or something like that. But actually putting that aside for a while and building something that solves a challenge in the world that actually brings more people into the presence of Jesus, we see as a real motivator and a real inspiration for why we exist. So that's sort of nutshell about um about who we are and the purpose behind why we put communities in these different cities around the world um i think currently we're in 37 cities globally and we have three online communities running so um that's that's the sort of size and shape of things yeah, yeah and i know you're a director of um of global communities and mm -hmm. what i really thought was super interesting about faith tech and the lab that i hosted it really sounds like you guys are just there to to kind of cultivate that kind of support that uh, some of these Christian builders need as they're going out and developing, you know, whatever vision God has laid on their heart. You guys kind of step aside and you say, well, you guys bring your ideas to us. Mm -hmm. We're going to help feed that, but we're not yeah. necessarily forcing our own vision of what we, you know, kind of want to see developed. It's uh, you guys are just kind of a support network. And um, there's not mm -hmm. really a lot of support networks, I would say, for Christians in the tech space at all um nice. we've we've had a lot of conversations with people specifically in emerging tech but that's just a common story that we we kind of hear so mm. what um how did you guys kind of become acquainted with this space are you kind of involved in tech already was it uh was it just something you were seeing or how did how did god kind of bring that about mm. i mean for for me personally so um my background is multifaceted. So um, I was uh, back in the UK. I worked um, as a worship pastor um, uh, part time. And then my wife and I had a small tech startup doing digital design and, and, and digital experiences for people. Um, and I was also a technology consultant in the National Health Service back in England. So um, helping build analytics systems for them. So I had this like multi vocational life happening and um, I think um, what I was experiencing before I bumped into this crazy tribe called Faith Tech was what a lot of people in tech experience, which was I had my sort of faith life over here, and then I had my my tech and my work life over here, and they never sort of talked to each other. I led a, led, led a pretty siloed existence, and um, I wasn't really able to um, you know talk much about tech when I was leading worship or b b building creative experiences at the church, even though a lot of that is technology driven, right? But um, I did feel like when I got into the more exciting parts of what we built through our business and stuff like that it was just like i was speaking a different language often in my faith environment and you get that sense of i don't understand it therefore i fear it and um and i lived this fairly separated existence which in in one way um was just really difficult to reconcile the two the two sort of lives i was living but in another way it was like burning me out because I was, you know, I was, I was putting on one hat to do all this, this, this tech work and build our business and all that sort of thing. And then putting on a different hat, um, for, for my faith community. And I found that really tough. Um, and then I bumped into, we, we'd moved to Canada back in 2018 and, um, bumped into this group called faith tech who were doing a meetup in downtown Toronto. And mm. I headed down there and, it, it was like this moment where I really felt God say to me, this is a space where those two parts of you don't need to be separate anymore. And it was a real moment for me. You know, people talk about moments of physical healing, moments of emotional healing. For me, this was this like coming together, this convergence moment where I was like, oh, wow, maybe there's a unique calling on me that incorporates both of these parts of who I am. Um, and I've seen that happen again and again and again for Christians who are deeply involved in building in the tech ecosystem, but then feel like they're sort of that the, their church life is completely separate to that because they don't, you know, the, the, there's a misunderstanding of what they're doing or big tech is seen as all bad or emerging tech is seen as this dark force that's going to take over the world. And, and they're dealing with all of that sort of preconception, yet they come into a faith tech environment where you know, let's not be, let, 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 let's not be unclear about it. Our 
core calling is to gather people, right? It's, it's, it's bringing them together so they can share the space together and find like-minded others. And, and in that, you find that real power because you see that, that barrier, that separation being broken down again and again. And then when that barrier gets broken down, the next step is like, man, what can I do with this? I've got an energy to build something with this. And, and that's where, and that's where the projects and the innovations come. And, you know, there are people way more advanced and way more clever with technology than I will ever be who come into our communities, but we just provide a space that can hold them there and can say, okay, you've got permission to build something here that deals with a challenge that you're, pa you're passionate to see dealt with in the world. So yeah, it's, it's been really amazing just to see that mini miracle happening for people again and again, as they think, well, my tech life and my church life doesn't need to be separate anymore. Um, there's a quote, our, our, our founder, James, um, talks often about a friend of his who, who uh, worked in Google. And she would say, when I'm at, when I'm at work and I, like my faith is a different language to them, no one understands my faith. And when I'm at church, my tech life, no one understands that either. So, you know, where do I fit? Where do I, you know, where do I find my common crowd? Where do I find the community that I can be part of? And that's why our, our purpose statement initially was we want to bridge that gap between faith and technology because so many people experience that gap and experience the difference in, in approach between the two that they just can't reconcile or can't engage with in, a, in that full and complete and converged way that I think God calls us to live in. Where do you think that, that, that sense of like not belonging comes from? Because it's like, you know, it, you, you almost are experiencing it as a double-edged sword, um, mm. in your life when, when that happens. And I can think of a multitude of, of ways where, you know, we're, we're tempted to think that, that we're alone in the situation that we're in, but, um, it, it's often as if like, you know, that's what, that's kind of what the evil one wants us to think to steer us away from, from our purpose and from our higher calling in our, in our lives. And I just want, I want you to kind of speak to that because I know a lot of people that work in tech, sometimes it can be some pretty lonely, lonely hours. Um, not a lot of human interaction, depending on the situation, there's a lot of temptation to, to kind of just close yourself in. And, and that's, that's as a Christian, that's the, we're called to majorly the opposite. Yeah, absolutely. So th there's two things I would touch on with that. And um, one of them is this whole concept of, of separation. And I think that, you know, the, the enemy wants to divide, right? The, the, one of the, the core, the, the, the core aims of the enemy is to divide, but we never think of that divide being an internal one that you can experience. Mm -hmm. Um, but I think the enemy works in that in a really powerful way. If he can divide this superpower of building that you've got, from this faith you've got in the all powerful sovereign God of the universe. I mean, he's stopping something amazing happening. And I think that's what we see again and again. And, and when that comes together, conversely, you just see amazing things happen. You see creativity lit up like it's never been lit up before. And you see the, the, these sparks of imagination that suddenly match up with something that God's got in his imagination that he wants to see in the world through this power of creativity that, that he wants us to, to use to represent him. And um, the other part is one of the core values of faith tech or the pillars as we call them is people over product. And mm -hmm. this is that we wanna see the value of personal transformation um, as a precursor to the building of really cool products. So we've, we've built this, we've built this playbook out, which goes through a whole process of taking a biblical framework to how you build a product. But the aim of that isn't just to build a cool product. The aim of that is to see someone discipled and transformed as they build a product. And as they realize that there is a biblical blueprint for design thinking, there is a biblical blueprint for how we develop technology. There is a, a biblical yeah. blueprint for how we go through discernment before we build and things like that. And I think putting the putting putting that into place alongside this people over products value is that we really encourage people to build together rather than in, in isolation um and you know we've all got that fixed image in our head of the of the of the developer who's got the headphones on in front of um you know visual studio code for like eight hours a day without any human contact um 
we because we do our building in community we try to rub against that a little bit so that there's this sense of people building together drawing on one another's gifts and talents which aren't always development talents you know it can be someone's a product manager or someone's even like a digital marketer or a finance person and coming together into this team and leaning on all their creative skills to build something together and I think that very act of doing it together is an amazing representation of the body of Christ. And in that you see transformation because we're practicing what Jesus and then what Paul wrote, we should be doing as many bodies with, as one body with many parts. Right. Yep. Yeah. And, and Christianity kind of has like this built in concept of community. You spoke about like the body Absolutely. of Christ There's this idea mm -hmm. that we're all working together uh, to build, build something. And it does seem the case that a lot of times today, tech kind of just gets built aimlessly. Um, people mm. aren't really thinking through what what are the social implications of this tech? You know, what is the uh, what ultimately do we hope that this tech is going to accomplish in people's lives, not just what it's going to do for efficiency mm. or for work, but uh, actually in people's lives and Christianity in Christians in general tend to understand that that um, there's it's kind of like a higher calling or higher purpose to the things they're building. So I'm kind of mm. curious too. Uh, we're talking about uh, building community uh, and how people working in tech sometimes feel isolated when they're at work. They can't really share the Christian aspects of their lives. And when they're with Christians, they can't really share the tech aspects of their lives. But it, it does also seem that, I, and I think it's probably likely that there's a considerable number of Christians that are working at, say, a company like Google. Uh, mm. But Christians don't really, in those types of environments, we don't really work together or we don't really act as necessarily a, a single body of Christ uh, in those types of scenarios because it's you know, it's work versus social life versus church. We kind of tend mm. to compartmentalize these types of things. But yeah. uh, it seems that if Christians were working together much more, then we could start to answer some of these questions about the tech that we're building um, mm. you know, much more closely because we're working with, uh, with our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. We know ultimately what what types of visions uh yeah. for the world that uh in ethics and uh that we should be building into these these mm. protocols into these programs so yeah. is that is that the case i mean you you do say that faith tech uh is is promoting that 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 culture of let's build something together with all of our different parts um mm. and do you find that as tech people are coming to faith tech that they are then going out and, and building technologies that are then doing more direct good for the church and for, for society? and Or is it more of just a ministry to speak to people that are they're working in tech? Yeah, so yeah, I'd say it's a bit of both really, but, um, and there's, there's two elements I can talk to with that. So we've got a bit of a, you know, a, uh, a posture towards technology that we that we that we've sort of built out through again through this playbook in the last year where we look at the different types of technology or the ways of technology and you lent into you know this inconsiderate way of building technology we would call that reckless technology you know the the old um mantra of move fast and break things and it's mm -hmm. like it's like i i believe that that mantra was created with a heart for innovation at the beginning mm -hmm. But like with a lot of these things, um, those who would want to exploit it, get their hands on it and use it as an excuse to build in a way that has no consideration for the humans that they're, that they're affecting. Uh, and then you get stuff built super quickly just so profit margins can go up and wealth can be transferred from the well, poorest to the richest. Progress, progress for the sake of progress. Exactly, exactly. And or, or just building in a way that literally treats people like commodities. It's like, we've got to get this done quickly. Therefore, the people who are actually building it are treated like commodities. And if you're not building quick enough, you're out, you know, and there's this whole concept. And but then what the world would do in response to that, and I think it's a great expression of what we might call common grace, is responsible technology, which is you know, instead of the, the zero sum game of reckless tech where someone wins and someone loses every time, this is like, we, we both sort of win or we make sure no one loses, right? It's like, let's build with a, with a mind for ethics and sustainability. And let's build in a way that maybe undoes some of the harm that we'd done through the reckless phase of building technology. You know, there's this sort of recognition that, oh, maybe what we've done hasn't been so good. Um, and that's great. And that, you know, and that sort of tries to focus on human flourishing or, or preventing things which might stop human flourishing. Um, but we think 
and believe strongly that there's a biblical model, the, the model of Jesus that goes even a step further than that, which is redemptive mm. technology, which is I will sacrifice something to bless others. And you see this in the in the example of Jesus himself, who had all the authority of heaven and earth, yet consciously took himself to the most vulnerable place of death on a cross and did that so that he could bless the whole of humanity by restoring relationship with God. And, and I know that is like, that's something of cosmic relevance that we'll never quite get full understanding of, but we believe in its simplest form when we lay down our own desires and our own human inclinations for things and build in a way that blesses others and lifts them even above ourselves, that's, that model is so countercultural to what the world would have us believe and even goes beyond the common grace of being ethical or sustainable with what we build. And um, that's, that's sort of one part of it. And then the other part is how we build. So there's this whole question of, um, you know, do we build in a, in a move fast break thing sort of way, which is this relentless iteration without much thought or discernment in between. And, you know, um, we, we put in our process, we've got this process we call the four D's, which has a process of discovering and, and Connor, you would have experienced a bit of this on the web three lab where, you know, when we come face to face with a challenge, we believe the Bible offers us the model of lament, for example, where you, you take the problem to God. And you ask him to help you resolve it. You ask him to give you the inspiration to resolve it, that he already knows the solution, right? Um, and then the next process instead, like, you know, my tendency would be, okay, let's go ideate solutions. Let's brainstorm. Let's get as many on the board as we can. We actually put a pause there and go through a process of discernment, which is like, is technology even the answer right here? Should we build something? Because we could build something that gets used for desperate evil right and it's we need to take that sense of consideration so we actually build these pauses into the process and then the development cycle is one which we've built a liturgy around which is a, a prayer focused liturgy which you go through all the iterations of your build seeking to get wisdom from god as you build um, mm -hmm. and then the final bit is demonstrate where we look to demonstrate the redemptive impact of what we built through the relationships we formed through the process of building as opposed to the numbers or the, the 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 amount of users or the finance that's been raised for it, and I know that's a very different model to what we used with, and um, and the idea behind that, when we go back to our friends who might work in Google or Facebook, is, and, and I'd say this this is a personal view I've come to, um, which is you know they they're doing great work with ERGs and things like you know Christians at Facebook and the Google Christian Fellowship and everything else, but I'm like. Is that creating just another church inside a big tech company? Because right. what I'm hungry for are the Christians who've been in community together to be dispersed into the tech ecosystem and make fundamental change through their worldview and through how they work and how they describe concepts to their colleagues. And yeah. even taking one element of the 4D framework and saying, do you know what, in my design thinking meeting, I changed the way I thought about coming up to a challenge because I learned about this process of lament and then yeah. seeing that more deep rooted dispersed transformation in the tech ecosystem that I think would make fundamental change. What's been, what's been some of the better um, evangelization stories that your organization has been able to bring about? I'm sure you, you get, you know, some pretty good witnesses of, you know, people who, you know, may have never encountered the faith mm -hmm. or, you know, their friend went to, the group and then was like, Hey, you should come check this out. Like what have been some of those, uh, witnesses, uh, to the gospel that this group has been able to uh, bring about in the space? Yeah. I mean, there's, there's lots of smaller examples, which, which I feel have a bigger impact than we can ever know. So yes. like, um, a, a friend of mine in Toronto who was part of the faith tech community there, who, just this, and this is going to sound so simple, but I think it made reverberations in his team. He mm -hmm. was part of a, a, an agile software dev team, you know, where someone's coding and you've got someone standing over their shoulder watching them code and then they'll swap after a period and then they'll keep doing that interchange. And they hit a problem in the code that they just could not get to the bottom of. And they, they kept trying to brainstorm solutions. They kept trying different ways out of it and everything else. 
And this guy said, I'm just going to pause and I'm going to go away and I'm going to pray to my God. I'm going to pray to you know, the, the God that I believe in, who's Jesus Christ, and see what happens. And he did that and he came back and the next line of code they wrote solved the problem. And it's like, it's lo lots of little things like that, lots of little behavior shifts and changes that I think uh, you would look at and say, oh, that's a lovely little story. But then mm -hmm. the guy he was working with must have just thought, what the heck just happened there? Um, mm -hmm. Particularly when your mind is set around the code is always the answer, right? The answer is always going to be in code, the code. Code is law, right? <laughs> you know, and it's like, and it's like that happened. And then you've got, um, you know, I had another story I heard. We did a we did a, a city leads. So all of our community leads came together for a retreat back in December. And um, one guy said, you know, I mean, he works with some other Christians, but they've actually taken this uh, this 4D redemptive tech framework and said, we're going to use that as our dev cycle. We're going to try it and see if it really does make a difference. And they're building stuff for Christian and non-Christian organizations. And I'm like, sure. oh, I'd love to see the I want to go back to him in a year and say, okay, what's been the results of that? What sort of conversations have you had with your customers and your clients as a result of implementing this different framework for how you build stuff? And we just get this constant feedback on it as well from a really practical perspective of this bit worked really well, this bit needs some work in terms of the tools and the practical ways we implement it so that it can be spread further and wider. So yeah, there's been lots of stuff. And then there's, there's the impact of the products that have been built as well, which we've seen bunch of stories coming back from those as well. Yeah, I love um, I love your vision of sending Christians back out into the tech world yeah. to go for us yep. into, you know, basically revolutionize or um, give a revival to the Googles of the world. In some yeah, sense. I mean, we don't need more Christian ghettos everywhere. Do you know what I mean? Right. We don't need all to yep. find other Christians and then put a wall around us. And then, you know, I don't yep. think that was the design. Um, and I believe that I believe that church and I believe that Christian communities, even faith tech, are there to equip and send. They're not yeah. there to equip and keep safe. It's there yeah. to equip yep. and send out. And if we're not doing that, if we're just creating a nice place where people are staying and keeping the barriers up around them, we've 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 lost the plot somewhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah that kind of answers my, uh, one question I was having. Then is I was curious: Does Faith Tech see itself as primarily a ministry for people in tech, or does it see itself like primarily as a ministry to send people into tech? Um, and it sounds like it's kind of the second, the the, the latter in a sense. Well, I, I mean, think both, it's, but, yeah, yeah, I think it's both because okay. um, if you want to send and equip people to go back into that dispersed environment, there's got to be the common place for them to come to for for that to happen. And I think without yeah. one, you might miss out on the other. Um, mm -hmm. So so yeah, I th I just see this this gorgeous cycle of you know as we see stories of people coming back and saying, hey, this is how it changed the very way I work or the way I yep. in interacted with my team, that that story then, you know, gets to other people in the community who are like, oh, do you know what? This is meaningful. I can make meaningful change. I'm not just there uh, yeah. to be in front of my screen all day. I'm there to make a difference for Jesus. And I can do that through code. Yeah, I can build stuff, but I mm -hmm. can also have an influence to those around me, to the people I'm working with. And, you know, yeah. I mean, we just dream of seeing bigger tech leaders turning their lives over to Christ and saying, Hey, totally. I found a way of working through these people that work with me that has transformed the way I think. And it led me to this person called Jesus. Yeah. Well, my contention has always been, uh, so we were, well, mostly in, uh, we started at least as a crypto, a web three style mm -hmm. podcast, and we kind of expanded more to emerging tech, but specifically in web three. And I think emerging tech broadly, but, my contention has always been there was way more Christians in this space than meets the eye. Mm. Um, and as soon as we can start Absolutely. actually talking to people, we realize, wow, actually we do have a large community of Christians here. And it would be, it would be hard for me to imagine that Google is, there's not, there has to be a ton of Christians working at Google mm. with how big Google is. And I mean, just the United States alone, it's something like 65% well, think... of people say they're Christian. Like what I think percentage I know why. of people working uh, at Google Connor, are Christian, you know? I think I know why. It's because people, Christian, at least. Yeah, C Connor, it's because Christians, we, I feel like we're more equipped to accept things that are unknown. And yeah. in tech, especially emerging tech specifically, there's a lot of 
uncharted ground, unknown territory. And because we know that there's so much that we don't know in this life for what's to come, it makes us less afraid of those types of things in, in everyday scenarios. And tech is a field where there's a lot of unknowns and a lot of speculations. Mm -hmm. And, and I feel like as Christians, we're kind of equipped for that. I don't don't know, Kevin, if you want to speak to that a little more. No, well, I think as well, I mean, and this goes back to, I've been in a, in a few faith tech meetups where you'll see someone see someone else over the room and they work in the same company together. And they're like, I didn't know you <laughs> yeah. were a Christian. And I mean, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, and, and it goes back to what we were talking about earlier, this whole thing of separation in that yeah. the enemy doesn't want your colleagues knowing you're a Christian yeah. at work. He exactly. doesn't want sure. other Christians knowing you're a Christian at work, exactly, yeah. because if they do, you might come together and do something meaningful with that. And right. it's a, it's and, a, it, yeah, it's a game changer. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Well, we because tend to we're, think we're, we're like the, a minority in this yeah, space, and I think that e- causes us to think we can't do very much good because it's like, oh, it's just me. Yeah, the the evil one is a fear monger. He wants you to be afraid, and yeah. like he feeds off fear, and he wants you to feed off it too. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, yeah, and I think that you know there was there's one story of um, here in, in Waterloo where. Uh, Faith Tech first started. Uh, one of the first meetups, two guys from the same business. Um, saw each other across the room. I didn't know you were a Christian. And the other ones, I didn't know you were a Christian. So they started meeting once a week for lunch and reading the Bible together and then asking the Lord how they could take what they were reading back into the workplace. And it's like, no wonder the enemy tries to keep them separate if that's the sort of thing that happens when you start getting people together. So yeah, I think there's, there's, there's often a lot more going on under the surface than we would ever know about. Um, But yeah, I think that the, there's this prevailing narrative, particularly in big tech, that um, that that is anti-Christian, right? That is, you know, you you can't display your faith because that's seen as a risk, or that's seen as something yeah. that could get you laid off, or or whatever. And um, mm-hmm. I don't know if that's a true aspersion um but it's certainly one that's there and it wouldn't surprise me if it's just uniquely planted by the enemy to stop christians coming together and making a change yeah yeah totally um and i mean that's something a small part i guess of what we kind of hope to do with this podcast is just inspire mm-hmm. people that there is kind of a christian community here in this crypto and uh emerging Absolutely. tech space and i feel like faith tech is kind of doing the same thing now mm-hmm. so let me um yeah, let me great. ask you one more question then about uh at the beginning of the podcast you you outlined your vision or this new vision that you guys are developing to what spark a revival uh, in the tech to space? To awaken a revival, yeah. Awaken so, a revival is the yeah. language. So we okay. would never see ourselves as being able to spark or ignite a revival. It goes back to, you know, where um, it was a trend during the 90s and early 2000s. People would have revival meetings, right? And it's like, my mm-hmm. thought to that is, you don't get to do that. You don't get to call a revival. Like God starts a revival. The Holy Spirit yeah. coming into a space starts a revival. So the whole thing of awakening. Well, I, I was raised charismatic, yeah. so I'm very familiar, you know, with this. Yeah, uh, with this exactly. Language. Yeah. Brand Brandon's Catholic. I don't know if you caught well, that. Well, I've been in, I mean, even on the Catholic side, I've been in some pretty charismatic Pentecostal circles. So I'm mm. I'm not too different from you, Connor. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And do, do you know what? I love, I love charismatic ministry as well. I've been, um, as in much of my church experience, I've been in charismatic circles as well. But the whole reason we would use the word awaken is that we believe God is on the move already. And we believe he is doing a thing in and through technology. Um because technology is largely the operating system for society right now, why would God be absent from that? Why would he not be moving in some way through it? So Mm. what we see our role is to waken people up to the perspective that he is doing something and to get them Mm. excited and ignited in that respect. So, you know, it goes back to that Ephesians uh, scripture. It says, you know, wake up, O sleeper, rise from the dead and christ will shine his light through you and it's that thing of you know wake up to the fact that god is on the move we see that because mm-hmm. of the amount of interest in what faith tech is doing in different cities in the world and um, god is on the move we get to play a small part in that but it's not our brand that's doing a revival it's not our label on things it's god's mm-hmm. doing a thing and we want to retain as humble a perspective as possible and just be doing the bit we've been invited to partake in and we see that as bringing people together and waking them up to the perspective where, of where God is on the move and how he can help them leverage their skills, their talents, their passion to be part mm. of that larger movement of what's going on. That's beautiful. Yeah. Um, so that answers a lot of my question because my question was going to be then, okay, do you guys see yourself as awakening a revival in the tech community now? Or do you guys say we're awakening a revival 
through the tech that's being built that is being built now you know for the mm. future so we're a very uh, emerging tech podcast we're kind of christian futurists here we, we kind of like yeah. to think about the future mindset and i think a lot of christians are scared particularly about emerging tech but even about a lot of tech we have today you know big tech mm. they're just scared about tech in general but particularly yeah. when you talk about emerging tech is this this idea that oh we're, we're building these kind of insidious tools that are going to be used to to drive more control uh, mm. as we as we head into the future but this is my thesis uh and this is why i might say i don't think people might almost think that would be a heretical thing to say but that tech could maybe drive a revival my thesis is we are building tech today that is going to define ultimately what the future looks like it's going to define the landscape of the future mm. in some in some fashion of course other things are going to define it too but tech is going to be a big part of it mm. is that future christian ultimately i think every christian is, is would be would have to say yes we are obviously mm. working towards ultimately a totally christian future so therefore a new heaven and a new earth yeah <laughs> right exactly so yeah. is the tech that we're building today is that going to drive the revival of the future and what can we do to to make sure that happens and to guide that you know i mean ultimately it's a destined reality but that doesn't change the fact that we're building it now and we have a responsibility with the way we're building things today yeah yeah absolutely and i feel that's a a, a, a real piece that we feel called to do which is to get people to think deeply about what they're building and how they're building it um, right. and the, the 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 how they're building it is the is the transformational piece for the person building it but then the what they're building is the transformational piece for the world they're building for um, right. or the world they're building toward um, yeah. and that's where i think you know when we when we think about a lot of the emerging tech i think much of the fear around it is lack of understanding and part of our role is we want to start conversations in the church about, you know, why are you afraid of this? Or what is the reasoning behind that fear? And have you looked at the opportunity that comes alongside some of this technology, as well as the idolatry, right? Because there's both. There's always going to be both. Um, um, but I feel that um, often if there's misunderstanding or a lack of understanding of an emerging technology, people will put it all in the idolatry bucket, which is mm. this thing is being built to take over the world and, you know, and, and hand it over to Satan. Right. And, mm. and, you know, I think particularly if you look at the Web3 space, A, because it's so nascent and fast moving at the moment. And B, because the concepts behind it, I mean, you try to explain to someone the blockchain who's mm -hmm. coming from, from point zero, and it's a tough ask, right, to get them to understand exactly what it is in really clear, simple terms. So it's like, man, I don't understand all that. It must all be fraudulent. It must be all stuff which is, you know, not right for the world. Um, and yet you look at the failure of traditional institutions in many places and stuff like that and say, maybe in some contexts, in a lot of contexts, there is a need for decentralization of sorts. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, and you need to look at these things in balance and think about, OK, now, now that I understand this, I can think about a theological framework around it rather than building a framework, a theological framework around something I don't understand. And I think that that yeah. reverse equation is often where we find ourselves. And I think that's that's why we just need to engage people in the conversation and and try and get yeah. that level that level of understanding up, so that then a reasonable theological framework can be built around it. Yeah. Have you heard of the uh, the EAC movement? You familiar with? I haven't. That? No. No. Okay. I'm very new to it, but there's a lot of people on Twitter that uh, they have their name stylized. That they have. <laughs> yeah. A, uh, uh, e slash ACC, EAC. Right. It stands for Effective, uh, ex effective Accelerationism, I think. It's, yeah, it's something like that. Yeah. Essentially, uh, it's these these hyper tech, tech optimists. And right. uh, it sounds a little scary. And some people kind of uh, <laughs> are like, oh, this looks cultish. But what's interesting to me about it, and I've, I've listened to... Uh, I've listened to a couple of people on YouTube now. It sounds kind of, it sounds rather self-aware. Uh, mm -hmm. I don't know how far they would push the, the tech optimism thing, but essentially the movement thinks that there's a strong move towards particularly AI safety, but also with other emerging technologies and people who want to tread very carefully about the development of these technologies, probably mm -hmm. to a lot of good, but they think that it's, it's holding uh, the space back in a way that isn't improving people's lives because there's a lot of potential with these technologies to mm -hmm. do a lot of good. And if, if the only conversation in the space is geared towards AI safety and tech safety, 
then we're not actually having anything that's kind of guiding uh, to what they would hope is a, is a better world. So mm. the main thesis is that we kind of need two sides of this conversation. Therefore, we Absolutely. we just have to take the full blown tech tech optimist tech accel accelerationism approach to kind of counterbalance mm. what is already a strong AI safety uh, approach. Mm. And I think I kind of like aspects of it. I think we need, especially in the church, we almost need an amount of that because there was so much, I feel like, fear mongering among Christians coming mm -hmm. when it comes to tech and to uh, emerging tech. And if that's our only stance, then we're not building the technology of the future. And that's like yeah. a scarier thought to me than anything. It's like, okay, then who's building these technologies? Non-Christians, yeah. because Christians are scared of it. Like that's also yeah. a, a terrible thought. So. Um, we almost need a, an amount of EAC in the Christian movement. Yeah. Do you guys find that you're, you're talking to kind of settle fears or do people come to you sometimes because are they are people, tech people who come to faith tech, are they somewhat or feeling that they're ostracized in the church? Is that why they're not able to kind of bring the test act aspects of their lives there? Because Christians don't like to talk about tech or, or learn about it. I think there's, I think it's partly that. And I think there's, the, 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 there's two sides to any of these phrases that get thrown around as well. So when I think of AI and some of the key fears that come from maybe the more religious quarters in terms of AI, it's all about dehumanization, isn't it? It's all about, yeah. oh, yeah, we're taking the human out of the equation. and We've taken taken things out there. And I, I, I had a conversation with someone the other day and I said, have you thought about where dehumanization could actually be pretty redemptive like in a part of the world where humans are at risk for spreading the gospel of Jesus? What about if AI could do that job? and mm. save some lives in the process you know and like and, and but people seem to think oh it's dehumanization therefore bad and it's like well yeah. actually think that through for a minute and i just don't think that conversation is always being facilitated i think yeah. it's it's too easy to jump on the memes that come on people's feeds and whatnot which are probably ai generated as well um, yeah. <laughs> that, that start planting all this fear right and it's like yeah. it's just ironic that oh so you're letting technology tell you what you should be afraid of in technology and yeah. it just creates this crazy <laughs> cyclical thing so yeah um i think yeah i think for us um and I think there's been some there's been some great stuff. There was the AI in the Church initiative last year where they did the big hack in 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 Boulder, Colorado. And I think like just having that conversation and having a hub where people can start to share some of the redemptive use of this technology will go a long way to allaying some of those fears. But mm -hmm. the first thing we need to do is get to a place where people are willing to listen. And um, and I think like. Uh, to do that relationship is always going to be the first step, isn't it? And, yeah. and that's where community comes back into it and coming with a framework of saying, do you know what? We've, we've had a really long, hard think about a biblical framework for building technology. Mm -hmm. So if we're building using emerging tech, but we're putting a biblical, we were using a biblical framework to build that, which includes discernment, which includes prayer, which includes inviting the Holy Spirit into every step of the process. Mm -hmm. Will you trust us to try and innovate in this space? for your good and yeah. for the, the, the good of others. And I think that becomes then a really powerful argument, not just when they see what's being built or what they are told is being built, mm -hmm. but rather how it's being built and the, the, the redemptive way it's being built. And if that's happening in community as well, I think that, that, that we'd go a long way to starting to have a more grown up conversation about what emerging tech could be in terms of, yeah. um, some of the revolutionary stuff it could do to support and grow the local church, not just, um, uh, yeah, not just, uh, you know, some of the bad stuff there, they're sort of often quoting. Yeah. Wild conversations in the space for sure. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, okay. Well, we've kind of explored a lot of, uh, the emerging tech stuff that I think we kind of wanted to talk with you and, um, mm. and what, what's also interesting is I said, we had Evan on the podcast, so he was, mm. We found him through Faith Tech, and he's a big AI guy. Um, yep. We also had Jay Chen on the podcast. Oh, from London. Yeah, I know Jay. He's running okay. the Light Dow, yeah? Right, Light Dow. Yeah. I had met Jay beforehand, but uh, I know he was also in the the the, the lab accelerator that I joined, hmm. uh, kind of developing NFT uh, stuff. Do you – maybe you can explain a little bit. You've, you've kind of told us about how Faith Tech is providing this community and this uh, this framework for that. Uh, in the tech space, but I'm kind of curious, are there any major success stories about tech that actually got built through faith tech that is now mm. impacting the church or even just impacting society, uh, broadly speaking, but what type of things are you seeing people building because they have now the support network of faith tech? 
yeah so i mean we've got a we've got a bunch of of stories from over the years um I mean, during last year, at any one time, we had about 90 projects running concurrently through our communities and our city, our city labs and things like that. Um, so a big problem we have is trying to harvest all the stories, to be honest with you, and to, 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 to see what's going on. But one that really comes to mind, which, which actually leverages AI, has been a project that's been running for, for a good two or three years called BioResist, which... Um, it actually started through a project that we'd called Searching for Hope, where there was a team just trying to buy up all the worst domain names in the world and redeem them for Christ. So they 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 bought the how to kill yourself.org domain name so that people who were trying to search for, you know, who are having suicidal thoughts and searching online of ways to to fulfill those, actually it it came to the top and had a redemptive message on the website saying, You're not alone. Here's places you can find help. Here's testimony of someone who attempted suicide but didn't manage to do it and how they're glad they lived their life out afterwards and and all this sort of stuff. We were like, wow, what if we just created this whole holy sting operation where we're buying all the website names that could be taken by the enemy and used for evil and actually we're we're putting redemptive content behind them and um, this one this this one group in vancouver um actually had a real passion about trying to stop sex trafficking but they were like there's all these great non-profits and charities stopping it at the point of supply they're trying to stop the gangs and the the the, the routes for human trafficking and the, the 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 massage parlors and all that sort of stuff in the cities they said but what about if we were looking at the point of demand so getting to the people who are trying to buy sex uh, particularly those who would try to buy sex online and actually reach them with a redemptive message because if the demand goes away the supply will have to go um so they actually built an AI chatbot that they put on escort websites and on like, you know, your equivalent of like Craigslist where you can go to the the the, the, air, the, the sort of darker corners of it and, and try and buy the services of an escort online. They just got this little ad that says, do you want to talk about why you're here? Um, and they've used an AI bot to do a sort of little bit of a triage process to work out if someone wants to have a conversation about getting their life back on track or discuss with someone why they are in this place and what's happened to them or why they're addicted to sex or why their their life is falling apart to the point that they're looking for you know companionship like that and um mm -hmm. and uh they they've now been funded to have a team of trained volunteers who the ai bot then passes off to when someone says yeah you know what i need to talk to someone about this and mm. yeah, i think last year they had over 900 conversations with people who were trying to buy sex services online and and the AI bot meant that they could at least triage the first level of conversation to the point that someone was serious enough to say, hey, I, I like a conversation with a human being about this. And I see real power in that. I mean, that yes. that 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 is a real redemptive use of that technology. Um, and uh, they were in our last uh, create process as well, which was like a four week hack we did in October. And they've just been building and rebuilding and honing the the, the, the bot uh, to make it much more uh, much more well trained and much more intelligent in how it deals with the different issues that people bring at that first level of conversation. So that's one that really comes to mind in terms of some of the more emerging tech, right through to we supported the Apologist project at the Create Hackathon as well, which is like an apologetics GPT. Um, mm. And, you know, that'd be a great resource for churches. Like, yeah. you know, send that to people who don't want to come through the front doors, right? And get them to ask all those difficult questions yeah. of a GPT that's been trained on apologetics. <laughs> and it's like, well, here that's we been, go. It's, yeah. it's the first layer. <laughs> that's that's awesome. been a big topic of a podcast uh, on a few cases, specifically with GPTs. There's mm. there's a little bit there's a heavy Christian movement that is very anti GPT and mm. uh, I don't know if you're familiar with a, a a resource called Pulpit AI does that ring any bells? I've heard of it but I haven't had okay. a proper look at it yet. No no it's a it's a resource developed as, as sort of a chat GPT for pastors and the big scare is that oh and it sort of writes their sermons for them pretty it much doesn't it doesn't write their sermons no it doesn't that's, okay. sermons. It that's helps. what everybody was yeah. freaking out about oh, yeah. okay. you, had, you had a michael trash. whittle you said it does yeah. not write sermons it's a resource for pastors to put their sermon into and then it can help split it up into like blog posts into social media oh, okay. it's a content Ooh. it's a content curator for mm. uh for larger form content like mm. similar to okay. a podcast yeah yeah great but it it sparked major backlash, and uh, 
And I and actually Adam, when we brought Adam on, he had written an article for Christianity Today that was kind of theorizing some potential use cases of of AI chat GPTs, kind of along the lines of exactly what you're talking about. Oh, by, uh, he's done a lot of work on Bible GPTs, yeah. Bible um, GPTs, right. Yeah. Absolutely, and that's yeah. major backlash too. Same same communities there. Mm. So that's that's actually where I get a lot of my thoughts about, hey, is the is the Christian space just too anti tech? Like we need more support for people that are building actually good resources. I think it would be hard for somebody to see the downside of the AI chat, jo- AI chat bot that you explain that's like, mm. you know, helping people get their lives on track when they're on these, these dark corners of the website. Like, where's the, where's the negative here? Like, there's obviously mm. good use cases for AI. Well, um, gosh, we're just about out of time here, but I want mm. people, because uh, we talk to a lot of builders in the um, mm. in the space, and I think a lot of those builders could see uh, a lot of good in faith tech and coming and joining communities and finding some more support networks for the types mm. of things that they're building. So maybe you could give us just a little bit of a rundown on how people can get involved with fa- faith tech, what kind of resources uh, they might uh, want to take advantage of, and uh, yeah, mm. how could, how they can just get in contact with you guys. Yeah, absolutely. So um, predictably enough, if you land on faithtech.com um, and click on the communities tab, you can see all the communities we're based in, all the cities we're in globally. And if you're near a faith tech city, they're bound to be having a meetup sometime soon. So I'd always say try and get to an in-person meetup. If you can't, we've got faith tech online meetups as well. Um, we've got a we've got one which is in the sort of the north in the Americas time zone, and then we've got one in the Middle East as well, and then one about to start in Asia as well. So we're we've, we're, we're hoping to get most of the world covered there in terms of online meetups, and they would generally take the same form as an in-person meetup where we meet together, we learn something together, and then we build together. Um, and we're also going to be launching a new version of our sort of create program, which is um, which is rather than event, it's a rhythm where we're inviting people into these 12 week rhythms of it starts with a challenge, you get a period to work through and build a solution together using the redemptive framework we've been building out um, and do that as many or as few times as you want as part of the community. But that's a really great way to meet other builders and to learn and disciple one another as you build some redemptive technology together. So um, they're just a few a few ways of uh, getting involved. If they fail, just hit me up at kevin at faithtech.com and I'd be really happy to point people in the right direction. Perfect. We'll be sure to share all the links to everything in, the, mm. in our uh, descriptions for the podcast. So yeah. yeah. And uh, one other thing is we've got a Slack awesome. channel with about 4,000 people on it from across the sort of faith and tech ecosystem. So um, I'll pop you guys the invite link as well. So you can put it on. Yeah, the please do. There. Please do. Awesome. Thank you. All right, cool. Well, we can close out then and um, mm. super happy to have Kevin Burgess on the podcast to explain to us more about faith tech. Like Brandon mm-hmm. said, we're going to drop those resources in the description so you guys can check that out. And uh, if you have any questions about uh, the things we're just talking about, and maybe you, maybe you have some stories about things that you're building in in uh, emerging tech and in tech and that utilize your Christian faith, please drop those in the comments. And uh, we would mm-hmm. love to hear about those stories and uh, get back to you if you have any questions, though. Otherwise, mm-hmm. we'll see you guys next week. Thanks so much.